<laughs> All right, well, it's three o'clock and we're gonna go ahead and get started. I hope everyone is so excited uh, to go on this botanical adventure together called Arrange Wild. Uh, and this is our second virtual program here at California Botanic Garden. And we're so thrilled to have brought these beautiful summer flowers to you. I hope uh, you've delighted in them and uh, have enjoyed, uh, I, I hope they've enjoyed the car ride home with you. <laughs> Um, we're so honored to be joined today by Linda Prendergast. And Linda, can you wave? Oh. Yay, there's Linda. Um, so Linda is, is just amazing. Uh, Linda is the head of our Native Designs Volunteer Group. And this is a group of really passionate individuals that have been arranging with California Native plants for over, I think, a decade, right, Linda? Almost 11 years? Right, amazing. So they have been really at the forefront of, of the art of floral design with California native plants, which is just so, so cool. And uh, they are going to walk us, well, Linda is going to walk us through this art form today. And we're going to discuss the mechanics behind arranging with California native plants. Uh, California native plants have uh, some really interesting facets when it comes to floral design uh, and some kind of distinct qualities that make them separate from flowers that you might encounter uh, you know, in the commercial industry or at the grocery store, and why we love arranging with California native plants and, and how Linda's got me so inspired about them is that they really celebrate a sense of place. They celebrate a unique California aesthetic and identity, and they are kind of the most sustainable type of flowers that you can possibly get. Uh, they're, they're native. They don't require nearly as much water. They can come right to you from your garden and they're very easy to grow. So I'm excited to have Peter Evans, our Director of Horticulture, uh, joining us today to uh, talk a little bit about how to grow these plants. Uh, so before I pass it over to Linda, um, I wanted to just describe the episode structure. So we're going to have Linda lead us through the art of making this uh, beautiful arrangement here. Um, and can everyone see Danielle, am I popping up on the screen here? Oh, great, okay. So we're gonna make this beautiful, beautiful arrangement, uh, just gorgeous. I'm gonna steal this one after the show, and you're gonna be able to have one um, on your countertop. It's so beautiful. So Linda's gonna lead us through the mechanics of this. And what I wanna tell you all is that uh, you might get hung up on a particular stem, or you might forget a particular uh, a part of the instructions. Do not worry, we're gonna record this, but we are recording it and we're gonna make it live within 24 hours so that you can follow through at your own pace. You can pause, you can start over again. It's going to be uh, a lot of fun and really accessible, so don't fret. Um, and the other thing is Linda's going to be kind of going through the steps as if it was a cooking show. So she's gonna show you some of the really fun ways that we use floral tape, marbles, everything in between. So I hope you all have a tremendous amount of fun. And after that, uh, after that session, we're going to uh, be talking with Peter and Linda about each particular stem. We're actually going to get into the nitty gritty behind each species and how you can include it at home. So the first part, pretty technical, pretty mechanical, really insightful. And the second part is going to be more botanical and how can we actually incorporate some of these beautiful, beautiful flowers in our own homes and gardens. So Linda, I pass it off to you. Uh, again, you are just so fabulous. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your impetus for Native Designs, and uh, how you guys, uh, what you guys do here at the Garden? Thank you, David. Welcome, everybody. I'm Linda, as David said, and I'm in part of a group of uh, 10 to 12 very passionate, very creative, very talented ladies called Native Designs. If you've been to the garden, you've seen our Native Designs garden, which is right in front of the Butterfly Pavilion. And that's the area where we grow most of the flowers that we use in our arrangements, although we do harvest all over the garden, especially out in the communities. Um, we do arrangements for events on campus and off campus. Uh, we have done the centerpieces for Forever California, for the Majestic Oak Dinner, for the Chamber of Commerce luncheons. Um, we even occasionally do a wedding now and then. The weddings uh, take a particular type of bride because we can't let her choose colors or choose flowers. We basically have to work with whatever is in bloom at the time when the order is placed. I started out in the floral industry in the late 60s and worked through it uh, through the late 70s. So my technique is pretty old school. And if you've taken flower classes at Mount Sac or at Cal Poly or at some of the other design schools, some of their methods might be a little more modern than mine, but mine work. 
the new ones work too, but um, this is the way us old florists do it. We're gonna make a deep vase arrangement, similar to what David showed you uh, in the intro. It's an easy arrangement to make. The nature of, of native flowers means that you're gonna get a meadow type effect. You can't do anything formal like a, a bouquet of roses. Um, the flower stems are generally pretty flexible. A lot of them are bent um, and have interesting curves to them, but we just work around those. So the vase that you have looks similar to this one. And we're gonna start by putting marbles in the bottom. Now yours already have marbles. Make noise. <laughs> we buy the marbles at the very glamorous 99 cent store. Now I'm gonna show you how to put a grid across the top and I'm gonna use green bowl tape. You have cellophane bowl tape. You go across, just like a big tic-tac-toe. Two rows this way. And two rows perpendicular. and a little tab down the edge of the vase. You need to do a ring around catching all those tabs with your cello tape. And that's because if you refrigerate your arrangement with cello tape, it could come loose. So your vase top looks like that. Now the marbles in the bottom act like the old time flower frogs. Do you remember flower frogs? There's pin frogs like this and this. There were glass frogs that have holes. This would go in the bottom of the vase and you would try to aim for those little holes to keep your flowers upright. But the marbles are a marvelous alternative and they're easy to use. If you use them over and over again, make sure you wash them in between time and bleach them. So you're going to add water. So Linda, can we just pause for just a minute while people catch up with the tape? I'm going to do the cellophane base too, so I'll oh, do great. it. The trick with cello tape is to turn the end under so that you can find it the next time, just like scotch tape. You can never find the end when it's stuck to the roll. And you're using cello tape for obvious reasons. It's a translucent vase, and you don't want your mechanics to show. Cello tape is actually new school. I always used green tape when I was coming up in the industry. Again, it's just a pound sign or a tic-tac-toe grid across the top of the vase and then around the outside lip. Of all the jobs I've had in my lifetime, and I've had a lot, working in the flower shop was my very, very favorite. You don't start out as a designer, however. You start out delivering flowers, which was my first job, uh, washing buckets, which I still do here at Native Design. Um, did I say delivering flowers? <laughs> Making bows. <laughs> right, making bows. And that's how you learn the, the basic part of what it is to come up in the industry. You don't get to be a designer until typically after a couple of years. Okay, so your base looks like this, with the cellophane tape across the top and around the lid. You've mixed up the flower uh, preservative in your water ahead of time, I hope, if you've done your homework. And then you're gonna fill your vase right up to the neck, the narrow part of the vase. Let's 
see how it's right to the neck right here? I want you to use your imagination and picture a target floating right there on top of the water, a red and white striped target. You're gonna put your first stems in straight up and down at the bullseye, and then the rest of the flowers are going to go in on an angle. So we start with greening. After you've delivered a lot of flowers and washed a lot of buckets and made a lot of bows, you graduate to being a greener. And that means you get to arrange the greenery and the vases and the centerpieces for the real designer. <laughs> We're gonna start with Ribes Fibernifolium. This is the tall, slender piece that's in your bucket. You check each one for insect damage. Sometimes uh, some of the greenery, especially here in the garden, can get chewed. If you have chews on it or little teeth marks, just cut that leaf off. The main most important thing you can learn today is to strip the foliage off the bottom of the stem. You never want foliage down in the water because that causes bacteria. That gets stuck in the stem and the flowers won't take up water and it gets all yucky. So fresh cut straight down into the bullseye, right in the middle of the grape. And Linda, did you cut that at a, at a diagonal? Right? At, a, at a diagonal. It allows the stem to take up more water that way. And you'll note that I'm using bypa bypass pruners as opposed to anvil pruners. The anvil pruners crush the stem and that doesn't allow the water to go up into it. So the bypass pruners are the best bet. A professional florist, and if you've been to any of the flower shops in the area, will use a very sharp knife, but they're professionals. Wow. Uh, we're going to leave the knife to the... I didn't know that. Wow. Let's take another piece of ribes. I love this plant. It has a beautiful kind of a reddish stem. And it gives a nice line. It establishes the height for the arrangement. Again, strip the foliage. There's a little hole in that leaf. There's a little hole in that leaf. Okay, fresh cut. And put them kind of opposing each other if they have a, a, um, a little bend in the, in the bracket. See how this one's kind of bent? It just adds more interest to your arrangement. These first stems are all going in the middle of your grid, and you wanna make sure that they're all down into the marbles because this is what forms a little bracing for the balance of the material that you're gonna put in the arrangement. So there's the ribes. I've established the height. Now, the general rule of thumb is about two thirds higher than your vase, um, but there are no hard and fast rules, so it's basically what you like. Next, we're gonna start with the barberry. Um, this is bay leaves. This is the big trees that you see out in the garden. And again, strip all the foliage off the bottom. And when we were out harvesting on Friday, David actually told one of our guests that these little berries are related to avocados. I'm not sure I buy that. David, is that really true? <laughs> it is true. I like to call them naked little avocados. Uh, they are related, and this is also uh, related to our European Bay, which you can find you know, in, in the grocery store, uh, and it has a really intense aroma. What I love about our Bay laurels is that it's three times stronger than the European variety, so I bet you're smelling it right now if you're rustling through those branches. Not going to get much guacamole off of that little berry. <laughs> Stripping the foliage, trimming off the damaged leaves. We're establishing the width of the arrangement. We're just gonna use three pieces. One, two, three across the bottom. Fresh cut. 
down into the marbles. So top width. Is everybody with me? Next, we're going to do, we're going to start. Why don't, we, why don't we just take a quick moment? I, I, we're getting a couple questions here. Uh, so we asked, do we, put, do we put the bay laurels on the center or what part of the grid are you putting the bay laurels? In? Outside of the grid, so that you're right at the lip of the vase. Can you see that? And just a note to everyone, you might have a little bit of extra material in your bucket. Um, and again, there's no hard and fast rules here. You can add a, an additional stem. Uh, you can subtract one if you if you'd like. But just to know, don't feel don't feel nervous if your if your quantities aren't exact to Linda's. She's really helping guide us here. This is the showy pinstamen, and this grows mainly out in the communities in the garden. It's the brilliant blue. It also comes in pink and white, although that's not nearly as common. And there's one called Margarita Buck, which I love, uh, which is a smaller variety of penstemon, and it's a, a beautiful garden plant. So foliage off the base. This one's going in the middle grid too, straight up and down into the marbles. You'll note that the penstemon has us flowers kind of all on one side, and it's bare on the other side. So put your Pedestrian in back to back. Down into the marbles. Beautiful. Can you can you hold the vase kind of close to the ca camera, Linda, just so everyone can kind of see what stage we're at? Oh, beautiful. That's great. Okay. Next, we're going to use the monkey flower, which is now called- We're just getting comments. We can kind of slow down just a hair. Why don't we give everyone about two minutes to catch up? And ask anyone that wants to ask questions, so the, the pen stemming went in the middle uh, part of the grid in the same area that you put the uh, evergreen current. That's right. Any other questions? We'll just give everyone about two minutes to catch up here. We're not in a race. You don't have to hurry. So we got a question about the number of bay leaf stems. I think you used three, right, Linda? I used three. If you have extras, you can put some up high, kind of toward the center. But for right now, we're just using the three and then we'll go back and fill in if we need to. So at this stage, we have the evergreen current and the uh, showy pen stem in the middle of the grid. And we have the bay leaves on the side or the lip of the grid. Right. Everything is just aiming at that little floating target there at the, at the, where the water um, line is just poking in from side to side. Okay, just answering two more questions. Yes, you can cook with bay leaves, although I recommend you use a, a third the amount if a recipe does call for it. It is really strong. Um, and then, I'm sorry, Barbara, you only got two bay leaf stems. Uh, nope, you can just use those two. And if you ever want another one, I will give you another one. <laughs> I'll harvest one for you. Sorry about that. Um, what was after the blue purple ones? Oh, we haven't done anything following the pen stems quite yet. The uh, pen stem comes the monkey flower. Used to be called Mimulus. Now it's called David. 
Diplicus? Diplic you got it, yes, Diplicus, yeah. That's when you know you're old because they change all the botanical names during your life. These will have little dead blossoms on them and that's only natural. So just snip those spent blossoms off. These are great to use when they come in great big clusters, but at this time in the garden, we don't have any great big clusters. The heat has been very hard on the flowers these last couple of weeks. Again, strip all the foliage off the bottom. Give it a fresh cut. And I'm gonna make this a little bit lower than the penstemon. The penstemon's here. I'm gonna put all the mimulus just slightly lower in kind of a vertical line. And what part of the grid did you put that in, Linda? First piece is in the outside. Don't worry about that grid. Just, just aim for the middle of the vase. This is not science, it's art. There's the second piece of mimulus. And if you can, try to get it all the way down into the marbles. And if it doesn't go all the way to the marbles, don't fret. And there's your little pop of yellow. That is so beautiful. And Linda, I think this might be a good moment to say, why, do we, are, why are we arranging the colors in clusters together? Why might that be a more effective style? That's a, more of a trend now. Um, it used to be you would put a mimulus, excuse me, a duplicate, a monkey flower, a monkey flower here, and a monkey flower here, and a monkey flower here, and a monkey flower here. But the more modern trends are doing it by variety uh, or by color block. And really with the California natives, the flowers are generally small. Um, you can't make a great big statement with just one petal or one flower, except with perhaps a matillaha poppy. And of course the matillaha poppy would be way too big to use in a vase that's this size. So you wanna keep things in scale and in relation to your, uh, the size of your vase. So we are doing color blocks now. What's the trend gonna be next year? Who knows? When I was coming up, it was all French bouquets and everything was round and tight and, and jewel tones, jewel colors with commercial flowers. And, and while they were gorgeous, they were kind of stiff. They were kind of old looking to me or old fashioned looking. Um, well, old fashioned if you were a florist, but uh, they were beautiful, but moundy roundy is what we call them. So. This is, this is loose, this is a meadow bouquet. So your mimulus is in, your diplicus is in, your monkey flowers are in the bay. And next let's go to the woolly blue curls. And I bet you know this flower already. These grow all over the garden. These are the woolly blue curls and you can see they have little fuzz all over them and oh, they have that wonderful fragrance. So let's go about a third of the way around the vase. Strip everything off. Love that fragrance. Down into the marbles. Through the imaginary target. See how I let the curve kind of go toward the outside rim of the vase? Just gives it a little bit of grace. Woolly blue curls is 
while it's not an easy plant to grow, it certainly is worthwhile in the garden. And it's a beautiful long-lasting flower in arrangement, one of the most long-lasting that we use. Okay, we're getting ready for the Cleveland Sage. And that's this fella right here. I call them pagoda flowers. They remind me of little Chinese houses. This is the sage. Again, let's go another one third around the vase. And these will go on the outside um, holes of the grid and probably one or two on the inside also. Interesting shapes. Again, out toward the edge of the vase. They just have more impact when they're used in multiples instead of singly. Singly. Some of you might have gotten the Alan Chickering variety of sage. It's a more brilliant midnight blue, beautiful garden plant. This is plain old Cleveland sage. Do these grow in Cleveland? <laughs> this is a good joke. Uh, the Cleveland National Forest, they, they're, they're oh. in that area, right? So there's your Cleveland sage. So we have the woolly blue curls here, the Cleveland sage back here, and the mimulus over here. So why don't we just stop for about like one minute, let people catch up and I'll answer a few questions or we can kind of tackle it together. Uh, someone said it would be helpful to tell which air, general area to put the flowers. And I think you mentioned this, Linda, the grid is, is really just a guide. We don't need to think really specifically about particular quadrants, is that right? No, you don't, don't think about quadrants. Just think about pretty. And so kind of the way you've been showing it is you've been kind of rotating the vase, you yeah. know, every time you put a different stem in, I think. Any other questions while we uh, let everyone catch up? All right, I think we're ready for the next flower. Let's do the white sage. Now the white sage is one of our mainstays in the garden. And these have just hardened off enough to use them. If we were doing this a week, 10 days ago, two weeks ago, this would be too soft to use. But they've hardened off well. And this gives you a rosette type of effect. And there's not very many flowers in the garden that do give you a rosette or a, a flat presence like this, like you would use a rose from your garden or a peony um, or how we'll use our, our uh, sunflowers. We're going to take this guy with all his fragrance and your hands will smell. But this is the same flower that is used that the Native Americans use for their smudge wands. Um, He's going to establish more width for us. One here. Now this one I am using around the base. One here. And this is actually the foliage of the white sage. Uh, why might we not use the flower uh, stalks, Linda? Actually, you, you could use the flower in place of the penstemon. You could use the, the white sage flower as your tall vertical in the center. Um, but the, the, the foliage is, is really a, just a workhorse for us. So again, that's brought the arrangement out. 
I love the way that the silver leaves let everything pop in that in that design. The silver is really a, a beautiful contrast. Um, you could use again for silver uh, artemisia when it's in season. It's a little soft right now, um, or coyote bush gives a nice silver contrast. And the silver with the blues, I think, and the, with the lavenders are just beautiful. Okay. I'm sure you're wondering about these guys in your face. This is the seed balls from, or I call them seed balls. I'm not sure what they are. Um, this is black sage, and these are the green pom-poms. And they're just something kind of unexpected and unusual to use in a vase. And that's why I like them. We always try to throw in something that kind of says, makes people say, oh, what, what's that? I've never seen that before. And these, again, you want to use in multiples because they don't mean anything all by themselves. You'll see that there's negative space in the vase where just the greenery shows, and that's on purpose. Negative space helps to define each flower that is used and give it its own character and its own attention. Now the star of the show is probably the sunflowers. And there's gonna be probably three or four in your, um, in your bucket. And they're different sizes. Some are large. I would consider this one a large one. This one is not quite as big. So you want the weight of the arrangement down low. And this is going to be a major eye catcher. So we're going to put as many stems as you have right at the base and let them spill over the edge of the base. There's one. These guys probably won't reach all the way down to the marbles, but that's okay as long as they're, they have their little bottoms in water. Keep your bottom in the water. And these are helianthus as opposed to um, the most common daisy you see in the garden is an encelia, and that is not a good cut flower. There, there's a lot of things in the garden that we do not cut, and we've learned it by trial and error over the years. Um, some things make a good cut flower and some things just don't last at all. Some things won't take up water. Some things just don't wanna be cut. Uh, we don't cut ceanothus. It doesn't last. It's beautiful, but it doesn't last. Uh, we don't cut oaks because oaks are just too precious. And we don't cut manzanita because manzanitas are just too important to our collection to mess around with. So the sunflowers are just used all around. How are we doing? Are we going too fast? Sure. Let's let's give everyone just a minute. That is just so stellar. Good. The 
if we were doing this in early spring, um, say in April or first part of May, um, we could use coral bells. Uh, we could use yarrow. Well, we could use yarrow now. Summer varieties of yarrow, um, monardella. Um, in springtime, the clarkia, the ranunculus, which is a little teeny tiny flower on a nice branch, would make it beautifully meadow-like. Um, Equisetum hymaly could be the horsetail reed could be used in the in the center. Grasses could be used up in the top, the muley grass. Um, this time of year, uh, Saint Catherine's lace can be used. That would be good at the edges here. It's very brittle. It's not easy to work with, but it's a it's a good cut flower. Um, Solidago is coming on, or ragweed, and that's a great filler flower. And it's, that's actually sold commercially. So um, there's not a lot of natives that are sold commercially. Solidago being one, um, and Salal. You have lemon leaf, which is a, a California native that grows up in the nice, cool, moist um, north northwest of the of the state. Fabulous. All right. And I think we have one more stem, right? We have one more stem and it's called Pearly Everlasting. And it grows like a weed all over the gardens, but it's really a beautiful filler flower. Um, I use this like a commercial florist would use baby's breath. So pull your stems apart gently. And we've cut this in its bud stage. Uh, you can actually uh, cut this a little later on, but it opens up and has kind of a yellow tinge to it. I think when it's open, it looks kind of dirty, but this is a nice bright white. So it's a good flower form for fillers because of that head. And this can basically can go anywhere you want it to. Aiming for that imaginary target. You can actually hang Pearly Everlasting upside down and let it dry. It's a good flower for dried arrangements. And that's it. That is stunning. So beautiful. Beautiful. I wish I could see all of our, uh, our participants' arrangements. I, uh, if you get the chance, take a picture and email or, or tag us on social media. We'd love to see what you made. That would be great. Now, I want to show you one thing. Tomorrow, this, the water in this vase is going to be murky. And that's because of this culprit right here. This is the white sage, and while it's gorgeous and beautiful, and it has a interesting earthy fragrance, it does foul the water. So you're gonna wanna take your vase, and I know this seems counterproductive, but bear with me. Place your fingers right through all the stems as best you can to hold them pretty much in place. Take it to the kitchen sink, and pour all the water out that you can get out. Take your marbles back into place. And then fill the vase once again with water. And it can be plain water because they've already had a good drink of the floral 
preserve their water. And again, right up to the neck, and you have nice, clear water that's gonna make your arrangement lots prettier. You don't wanna look at murky water. If you have any stems left over, go ahead and stick them in if you want to. I have a little bit of rubrum buckwheat. This is a wonderful plant. Just a little shot of color. And that's that's beautiful, yes, I love it. Absolutely stunning. So everyone, I want to invite Peter Evans on. Uh, he is our Director of Horticulture here at California Botanic Garden, and it looks like he's a panelist. Are you there, Peter? Let's see, it looks like his screen is there. Yeah, I'm here, David. Oh, there's Peter, and are you able to start your video? There you are. Here I am. <laughs> Fabulous. I thought I was going to be incognito today. Now, I would have dressed up for you had I known I was going to be right on there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, are, you, you get a pass. You are our fabulous director of horticulture. Thanks for being on. Um, and so I wanted to start a, a panel discussion here about the various stems we just used. And I want to hear a little bit more about them in terms of the aesthetic use of floral design from Linda. And then I'll throw it to Peter, because I'd love to learn, Peter, how, some of, how we might be able to grow some of these in our own yard and what requirements they might need. Sure. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so here we go. Also, I want to let everyone know uh, there's definitely time for question and answers afterwards for whether it's about the technicalities of making these arrangements or if it's about the horticulture, so uh, stay tuned. Um, so we're, what we're going to do is we're going to start with uh, the beautiful Catalina perfume or Evergreen Current. I'm gonna hold up that stem again so you can see. It's the very first stem that we used. has just kind of a faint, almost lemony aroma on the leaves that is just fabulous. Um, we sell it at our Grow Native Nursery right now. And in fact, I, uh, I pulled up the specimen here for everyone to see. It's just gorgeous. So Linda, can you talk to us a little bit about this plant and, and floral design? And I think maybe particularly about why green is so important. You know, it's not all about the flowers. It's not all about the color. Can you tell us maybe why you know, green is an important element of any of, any, of most base uh, floral designs. Well, it's just like we're painting your walls in a bedroom. Um, if you want to paint your walls white so that your furniture or your artwork stands out. So the greenery, the, the ribes and the uh, bay leaves is, is your white wall uh, up against what you, up against you, <laughs> against what you put your flowers so that the individual flower forms show and show off. The ribes, I like it. it. It's got that beautiful red stem and a lovely fragrance and it's just a nice linear and vertical um, piece of greenery. Awesome. And so Peter, can you tell us a little bit about, about this plant? It kind of has some unique attributes, I think, in, in terms of California native plants, right? Yeah, well, it's, um, it's typically used as a ground cover. I mean, it's a really beautiful green plant. It does have some red flowers, but they're very small and people typically don't really notice them. And so you're not really using it uh, for its floral display. Uh, display. Um, I'd say, you know, how to use it in the garden, it's probably most stunning under a mass of uh, island ironwood trees. If you could plant it in a grove of those, if you had the ability to have that in your backyard, that is really where it looks amazing. Uh, it's fragrant, so it would be great to plant it where you can smell its fragrance, like along a pathway, and you know where you can touch it. Um, or in a raised planter, it's really nice, a raised planter in the shade. Um, it will take sun on the coast, but inland you have to have it under trees in filtered light. And um, if, if it's too dense of a shade, it's not going to like that either. So, you know, filtered light is really the best exposure for it. Or like on a north facing slope, you know, you want it under trees that produce uh, sort of dappled shade. It's good under oaks. 
Uh, probably its, its best exposure is an eastern exposure where it gets morning sun. Um, you know, if it gets too much light, the leaves will turn sort of yellowish. And it's about two feet tall. It, a plant, each individual plant grows about four to six feet wide. And amazingly, even though the only place it grows is you know, on Catalina Island and on the coast of Baja, it um, is quite uh, cold tolerant. So um, I know someone who's planted it up in Mount Baldy Village and it had about three feet of snow on top of it and, and the plants are doing fine. And you wouldn't think some, uh, of a plant that grows in coastal conditions being able to tolerate that kind of uh, um, cold temperatures. So um, uh, it, you know, it kind of tends to have an arching form. And so if you want to keep it really low, you can sort of pin it down with drip irrigation staples. Um, it's really quite drought tolerant once it is established. And so it doesn't really need too much summer water, but you know, like all of our natives, if you give them a little bit of summer water, they tend to look a little bit better. Awesome, that's so great, thank you, Peter. And then the next one is the fabulous bay laurel, one of my favorites. And uh, we pointed out that it has these little, I think they're called droops, just some type of fruit, but uh, related to avocados, like I mentioned, and has that very intense aroma, which is wonderful. Um, and so this is a, can become a, a large tree. So that's something to know. Um, I grow one in a, in a container in, in my uh, backyard patio. Uh, you might not have the room to grow this in, a, in, the, in the backyard, but maybe you do. Uh, it's, it's evergreen, it's wonderful. So Linda, any, anything you want, might want to say about using bay laurel as we just did in the floral design? Um, we cut the suckers from the bottom of the bay laurel tree because they tend to be straighter and um, easier to work with. When you, um, you cut the drooping branches, because they're very graceful, but they droop, they can be kind of sloppy looking. <laughs> they're a good plant. And the bayberry is, is always interesting, the, the droop that you call it. Right. Peter, uh, what should we know about this plant from a horticultural perspective? Well, the biggest one in Mendocino County is 100 feet tall. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, that, that's an extreme example of what it could do under ideal conditions. But, you know, it, it, it's more likely to grow to be about 30 to 45 feet tall. Um, it can be, you know, pruned to keep it smaller and, and bushier. And like you were saying, it's actually a really good container plant. And, um, you know, it, it's pretty tolerant. It, it will take shade. It will grow in full sun. And, um, you know, apparently I haven't really observed this, but it's supposed to be a good nectar source for bees, the flowers are. So typically in the garden, you'd use it somewhere as a tall hedge or screening, you know, like you want to block out a two-story house behind you um, because its growth form is more vertical than spreading. Um, and, it, and it has that great uh, fragrant foliage. Um, and it, it really does want some extra water um, because it's essentially a riparian plant and it grows along streams and is in canyons. Um, and so, you know, you could do what is called coppicing with it, where you essentially cut it down to the ground because like Linda was saying, it crown sprouts. And so if you felt that your uh, umbellularia was getting way too big, you could just you know, cut it down to the, the ground and let it come back up. And one, one other thing to think about it is that it does release some chemicals that tend to kill off competing plants underneath it. So that is, you know, maybe a, a factor that would limit some people using it. Thanks, Peter. Do, do you know, perchance, if it grows in colder weather? Just a question from a participant. Um, I, I think it does. I mean, I've seen it up in Northern California in some of the inland valleys. So I, I don't, I can't tell you the temperature off the top of my head that it is cold hardy to, but it, it grows, you know, well beyond Southern California. I mean, and you know, it's up in our San Gabriel mountains. 
So right. it, you know, can get snowed on up there. Awesome. So it'll take snow. It'll take snow. <laughs> Um, so the next one of uh, uh, the plant that we were discussing is helping to establish the height of your arrangement, this fabulous showy penstem in here. And as Linda mentioned, one thing I love about our garden, you know, we have 86 acres and so many of the plants volunteer or reseed themselves. And so when you have 86 acres uh, and, and probably, I don't know, 30 of them full of this beautiful showy penstem, you're going to get some really interesting color variations. Um, I've seen uh, the occasional white. Uh, a really beautiful flamingo pink. So it's a plant that's full of surprises because you never know really what might come up. The, the predominant hue certainly is that kind of dark purple, which is really beautiful, but it can come in uh, various uh, other shades. Um, and it's a it's its Latin name, uh, Penstem and Spectabilis, is just perfect um, because it's just spectacular. Uh, so Linda, can you tell us a little bit about using this? What, uh, what other, you know, I know this plant's great at establishing height. What other, uh, native plant stems might you look to to establish the height of an arrangement? If we were using a great big vase, you could use hummingbird sage. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the coral bells is nice and spire shaped. Clarkia, um, there's two Clarkias. One is, help me Peter, one's elegant Clarkia and the other one is Susie Clarkia. And one is Godisha and one is the elegant. Clarkia, and, but they're they're beautiful beautiful pinks. Um, Farewell to spring is what Godisha is called, I believe, the common name of it. Um, you could use iris, very short lived. They don't last very long. The pentstemon are annuals, aren't they, Peter? We know well. You, you know, as a genus, some of them are. Uh, perennial and pensum and spectabilis will live more than one year. You know they get they get a bit ratty in the in the heat of summer, so we do pull a lot of them out. But it it will live. You know it could live several years. Yeah, they're they're beautiful. If you have a a blue vase, a cobalt blue vase, just putting a vase full of the uh, pensum and spectabilis and nothing else except a little bit of greenery is absolutely gorgeous. Love that, love that. Uh, Peter, anything we might want to know if we want to plant uh, showy pensemin in our yard? Yeah, I, I would find a really hot, sunny, dry spot that loves that. Uh, you know, a south exposure, full sun. It doesn't want too much water, um, especially in heavier soils like clay. And, I, and I've noticed because I've tried to plant it uh, occasionally up on the mesa, which has a clay soil, and it does not like that very well. Although we do have a couple big ones that have just come up on their own. But I would say it, uh, it, it generally likes a really rocky, well-drained soil. Um, it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't have any pet. Uh, pests. It, it, it could be good on slopes and you know you would use it uh, as an accent plant. You could plant it in a big mass where it's just you know super dramatic like in a perennial flowering border. Um, you know it, it lives about three to five years but the great thing about it is that once you plant it you always have it if you let it go to seed because it just as you were saying reseeds all over the place. Um, it's a good hummingbird plant, butterfly plant. It's fast growing, really good in the hot inland uh, valley gardens. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so now to, I, I, I say this all the time, this is one of my favorites, uh, but this is white sage, um, and we used it also to kind of delineate width in the arrangement, and I love that, you know, Linda pointed out, it's this beautiful rosette shape this isn't actually the flower, this is the, these are the leaves here. Um, and I love this plant, uh, it, it's a true Southern Californian in the sense that it, its range is, is, is very, you know, regional to Southern California, and it, it, it occurs in areas that many of us love to live in. Uh, so it's, it's, in that sense, it's, it's at risk in the sense that people are moving into these areas, they're developing uh, the chaparral and crystal sage scrub uh, habitats where it grows. Um, it's also, as Linda mentioned, a very culturally important plant to many Native American groups, uh, and it is considered sacred. So by planting this plant in your yard, you're helping contribute to 
uh, some degree of habitat restoration, you're allowing your backyard to become part of this living, beautiful tapestry of native plants that are supporting pollinators. Um, and you're helping safeguard this species, which you know, is increasingly at risk. One kind of interesting thing is that, uh, and sad thing actually, is that people are poaching it uh, because they're using it in smudge sticks, which are not authorized or uh, you know, kind of um, uh, acknowledged by Native American people. They're harvested by um, others and basically sold illegally on Walmart and Amazon. So that's a whole other story. But when you plant this plant in your yard, you're, you're really doing something beautiful for the environment. And uh, it's just gorgeous. So other than that, it's a beautiful, beautiful plant, has this amazing silver leaves. Um, and so Linda, can you talk us through, you know, again, why silver is just such a great uh, component of an arrangement and maybe some other uh, silver plants that you use in your designs? Basically, silver is, is a contrast. Um, and it's a contrast to the dark greens that you're gonna use, so it pops out. Um, the other silver plants, and the only two I can think of are Artemisia, which has a wonderful kind of licorice fragrance to it, licorice, licorice fragrance to it, and then coyote bush. Um, but by far, the workhorse is the white sage. Awesome, thank you. And so, Peter, um, what are some tips and tricks we might want to know in terms of cultivating uh, white sage? Um, well, it wants, an, again, a really hot, dry south exposure. It doesn't want too much water, but if you were to water it once a month, uh, and, that, and when I say that, I'm talking about plants that are already established. If it's a, if it's a brand new plant, you're going to have to water it more frequently than that. Um, it grows pretty fast, and um, its use, like what Linda was talking about, is as a foil in a contrast against green plants. Um, you know, maintenance-wise, you know, the, the flowering stalks get very tall, and so you're going to need to eventually prune those off if you think that's messy, but then the birds might appreciate it if you left them for a while so they can get at the seed. Um, it, you know, it, it's really useful if you want to create like a white garden or a, a white and silver moonlight garden would be a really great way to use it. Uh, bees and hummingbirds love it. So it's good for hummingbird gardens, bird gardens, butterfly gardens, bee gardens, you know, and then, you know, some of the smaller mammals and birds, you know, like sparrows, grouse, quail, they eat the seeds. And it does hybridize with some of our other sages, which, you know, horticulturally, it creates some really interesting cultivars, you know, that have sort of different foliage and, and flowers to them. Uh, you know, you use it, um, it's just like a mounding shrub. It's evergreen, even though it's silvery green. <laughs> um, it can be, it can get up to about five feet tall and it's perennial. Um, and sometimes you know, the flowering stems can be as tall as seven to eight feet. And it's really dramatic in bloom. And it has just has that wonderful gray, white, silvery foliage. And then, you know, if you, if you don't water it and it will survive that in your garden once it's established, it could go sort of summer deciduous and drop some leaves, you know, just like all the sages will. Great, thank you. And just for sake of time, and also because I, obviously they're related, uh, I want to pull out our other two sages we used in the arrangement. Uh, this, as Linda mentioned, is Cleveland sage. Uh, we actually used a couple of different cultivars in your, arrange, in your arrangements. Uh, this one is called Allen Chickering, and it's a very nice one to use. It's a little bit neater than some of the other Cleveland sages. And then the other Cleveland sage cultivar is Winifred Gilman, which has those beautiful dark, kind of darker, almost blue flowers, just really beautiful. And then the, uh, the, the black sage kind of uh, spent flower heads, if you, if you want to call them that, uh, that, that is black sage. And so, um, Linda, anything you want to add about using sages in an arrangement? They just add so much interest to an arrangement, Peter. Uh, I'm, look, David. Thanks, Linda. <laughs> One of you guys. Uh, <laughs> the unusual uh, image, the silhouette of the flower. Awesome. And so, Peter, any, anything you might want to add? Maybe 
What are some of the differences of, say, growing white sage versus growing maybe, you know, Cleveland sage or black sage? Well, I, I, I think the growing requirements are basically the same. You know, they all like really sunny, hot, dry areas. And, you know, really the only maintenance you're doing is you eventually are probably going to want to cut off the uh, dried up flowering stalks, um, but, you know, leave them a while for the animals. And then, of course, you're going to want to use them in your flower arrangement. So you, you've got to cut them off. Um, salvias, you know, they, they sort of benefit if you prune them back by about a third uh, in, in fall, because that will make them be a little bit more compact and have denser foliage. Great. Thank you. Um, and then we are on to monkey flower, that beautiful kind of orange, very distinct silhouette that you used in your design. Uh, that's in the genus Diplicus, and there's there's many different cultivars. Uh, this one's called Fading Fusion, which I just absolutely love. It it kind of gradates from a, maybe a tangerine to um, a peach, <laughs> um, but just really beautiful. So we sell this in Grow Native Nursery. Check out the website. Uh, we'll share the link. Um, Linda, can you just tell us anything about you know uh, monkey flowers in arrangement, maybe about other flowers that you might use to really add that pop? or that contrast against kind of our typical lavenders and, and uh, silvers? The monkey flowers are easy to use because you just kind of jam them into the vase or you jam them into the oasis if you're doing an arrangement in uh, a centerpiece type thing. They, they actually can you be a focal point and they can be a filler flower. So they're, they're easy to work with. Bright yellow, uh, mahogany colored, bright orange, faded orange, peachy like you have not seen that one before. We should have cut some of that. Um, they come in white, I believe, and they're, they're just kind of an all around workhorse kind of flower. Um, we use other plants the same way Russo Vada, the sugar bush, uh, gets a uh, kind of a dusty pink cluster of flowers at the end of the branch is a good one. Um, Verbena can be used as a filler. It gives a, a lovely lavender uh, tone. Annual lupin, um, which is brilliant yellow. If you were up at the garden a few weeks ago, you would have seen full flower bed in the Native Designs Garden. It's all gone now and those beds are fallow, but uh, the yellow lupin and um, the blue lupin, which is the perennial, that, that, that we're not allowed to cut, but sometimes we sneak a stem or two. On. Sorry. <laughs> Um, it, uh, there's just all kinds of good stuff out there. You have to learn by doing. You have to experiment, um, uh, not by cutting flowers at our garden, but by cutting flowers in your own garden. Right, great point. Uh, Peter, anything you want to t t tell us about growing monkey flower? I think it's just a very, at least from my experience, a pretty dependable bloomer and a nice kind of accent or small shrub, right? Sure, yeah. One of the best ways to use it is uh, in filtered light under trees and it likes to grow out you know like in the wild you see it kind of growing out from other shrubs uh, dense shade is not so good for it and you can grow some of them in full sun but you know then they tend to get a really burned up looking later in the season I mean you could plant it with um, in filtered light with things like hookara or ribes and it, I mean, it's very showy in a mass. Probably a morning sun exposure would be the best way to use it. Uh, it's good at the edge of an oak canopy and it's pollinated by hummingbirds. Well, mostly the red flowered ones, um, bees and sphinx moths. So it's a good pollinator garden plant. Uh, it's good in mixed perennial borders and as a color accent amongst other shrubs. Um, and it has, you know, a mounding form. It's not a really big plant. It, you know, it, it could, just depending, you know, there's so many different strains of them in the nursery trade. Uh, I don't think it would, you know, get much taller than three feet. It could spread out to four or five, but some are much more compact. It's perennial. Uh, very drought tolerant, but it does look better with some water. Um, and, and then there's all kinds of uh, nursery uh, grower created hybrids. Um, there's something called the jelly bean series and 
you know, they, they've been hybridized so much that, you know, it's kind of like, who knows what you're really getting in the nursery trade, but um, you can also deadhead it to keep it blooming a little bit longer and, you know, pinch the shoot tips to make the plants a little bit more bushy and have denser foliage. Awesome. Thank you. So just for the sake of time, I want to blitz through these last three and I, and uh, anyone can, ask, when we get to the question and answer, can ask a specific pointed question if we go too fast through these, but I just want to make sure we save just a little bit of time here for questions. So Trichostoma, one of my favorites, woolly blue pearls, just, just so beautiful. Uh, Linda, anything you want to tell us uh, quickly about using uh, woolly blue pearls? A good dependable cut flower. Um, you want to strip those dead flowers off the bottom of your stem there. Uh, this time of year when it gets really, really hot, they get a little tired looking, but uh, early in the season, in the spring, <clears throat> if you cut it in the bud stage, beautiful, long lasting, and again, that wonderful purple fuzzy color. Awesome, and I know Peter, we could probably talk for a day about trying to grow Trichostoma, but any kind of uh, quick tips and secrets you can share for cultivating this plant? Yeah, it's just another one of those plants, you know, that likes a really hot, dry south exposure. You know, it's a coastal sage scrub or chaparral plant. Um, I would say to deadhead it, which means, you know, to cut off the old flower, you know, the inflorescences when, when they start uh, fading in color, just because then they're going to start producing seed and then the plant will stop uh, blooming and ideally give it good drainage. Um, and if you're going to plant it in clay soil, then you just have to water it sparingly. Great, thank you. All right, so this is a little unfair to Peter because he did not know we were going to use these plants. But as flower harvesting goes, you might not know what you're going to get until you go out into the field. <laughs> so uh, we used this uh, beautiful pearly everlasting, uh, Linda, you mentioned that you kind of use it as a replacement for baby's breath, which probably a lot of our participants are familiar with if they've done floral design before. Uh, any kind of comments about how we use uh, Pearly Everlasting? Well, the Pearly Everlasting, I said, as I said, can be dried. Uh, it's a good white contrast with the other things that are in the arrangement. Um, you could fill also with, uh, in the springtime, bladder pod, which we're, you're not seeing today. Um, uh, of course, the monkey flower, the pruly everlasting. Solidago is a, uh, a good filler, and the St. Catherine's lace and verbena. Um, but the pruly everlasting is just so plentiful and easy to find. Great. Peter, uh, anything just out of the bag you can tell us about growing pruly everlasting? Yeah, it's, it's really a, an easy plant. I mean, it's like no muss, no fuss. It's, it's naturalized in the botanic garden. It, we never plant it. It just comes up on its own. It wants to grow in full sun. Uh, there's really not a lot of maintenance to it. And, you know, we just pull it up after it's done flowering and when it starts to get a little bit ratty later on in the season. But I mean, it, it can be perennial. I suppose you could cut it back if you wanted to, because if you, you, know, you thought it was not looking very good and kind of tired. Um, but it, you know, once you plant it, it recedes itself quite heavily. So uh, be prepared to pull up seedlings where you don't want them. <laughs> Great. All right, and the very last one, the showstopper. Um, this is uh, our, our beautiful uh, helianthus species or a sunflower species. Um, and I'm not actually particularly sure of the, the exact type of species. I think it might be a cultivar um, from our garden. And so, Linda, can you talk to us about, you know, these, these kind of showstoppers? I think one thing's important that you mentioned is that many native plants are more of that kind of spire-like, vertical, tall and narrow uh, uh, forms like penstem or coral bells. This is one of the exceptions, this beautiful, beautiful sunflower. Any other, any other uh, flowers that you might use to get more of that round shape to kind of counterbalance those uh, spires? Well, that, the helianthus is truly a, a focal point uh, flower and it really draws your eyes. And there, there's nothing more cheerful than a great big vase of nothing but sunflowers and greens in it. Um, California poppies is another good focal point in a deep vase. They don't do well in oasis, but they'll do well in water. They're not, of course, nearly as tall. Uh, the iris, um, which are long gone now, 
uh, the Matilla hot poppy, um, which if you cut it in a bud stage when the white is just cracking and that little ball will last for several days in an arrangement. Um, and yarrow is the rounded. And then of course, good old white sage. Perfect. Peter, I know this also was a surprise. <laughs> any other any comments you might uh, want to mention about sunflowers? Yeah, well, you know, sunflower, again, I, you know, I'm, I'm, you, everybody's going to get bored of me saying this, but it wants to be somewhere really sunny, hot. Uh, it, th this plant will bloom better if you do water it. We don't ever plant it. It comes up in the garden in certain areas. It reseeds you could uh, keep it blooming longer if you were to cut off the old flowers. But then again, the animals like, like to eat the seeds. So if you have a habitat garden, then you probably don't want to be doing this. But, it, but it, it's really no work. It's a big plant that gets over six feet tall and it's blooming probably well over six months out of the year. And just, you know, after say two years, you know, when they get kind of woody and they're not blooming as well, we just pull them out of the ground and there are new seedlings that come up wherever those plants have been. Awesome. All right, well, thank you, panelists, Linda and Peter, so much for your insights. It was so great. Um, so I want to open it up to any questions before we close out and bid adieu and let you enjoy your beautiful arrangement. So anyone have any questions? Uh, if you do, just type them in the chat box or the question and answer box and Danielle will uh, let us know. Uh, let's see. So our first question here, um, are there any of these native plants that shouldn't go together? Do any of them hinder each other's growth? Possibly. I don't quite know if the, I don't know if the question was for growing or for arranging. So maybe maybe Linda and Peter can both, can both. Go ahead, Linda. As far as flower arranging goes, you can put anything together that you like. Um, the spires around in here, the rosettes around in here, and the fillers just everywhere. Um, there'll be a few colors that will be really shocking, but that's kind of fun. Yeah, and, and, and out of the garden, uh, you know, it just depends what your taste is. You know, there are people that only want to plant a, a few colors together. Some people like a riot of colors. So I think it, uh, as far as putting any of these plants together in the garden, you know, that's, that's probably up to you and what you think is beautiful. I think um, what's, maybe are there any plants that, I think the term is alleliopathic, which is kind of a mouthful, but like we were mentioning, bay laurel might actually deter other plants from growing around it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the, where we have it in the garden, you know, I mean, our garden's huge, so the, it, that's not really an issue. But, you know, if you have a small residential garden, you probably don't want to plant a bay laurel there, <laughs> you know, because it's going to get uh, really big. Um, I, I think, you know, when the bay laurel it is spreading out uh, at the top, and then that could create some problems. But if you were to keep it reined in, then you'd probably be okay. Awesome. Any other questions? We can take just a couple more here. Yes. Next question we have uh, thoughts on best annuals to use for arrangements. And the follow up question to that was so you can use poppies? Question mark. You can use poppies. Um, they don't last very long and you want to cut them when they are, on all flowers, you want to cut them in the morning, number one. You want to cut them when they are fresh. And with a poppy, you want to cut it when it's closed like this, not tight and not covered with green, but maybe the flowers just peeking open and then put it into water. Don't put it into oasis. So poppies are, yeah, they're a good cut flower. And we received um, a lot of questions as we went about uh, species names. So to all the participants, Kristen emailed you to schedule your pickup time. I'm going to give her the list and have her email everybody a nice follow-up email that has the common name and the species name. Um, I was furiously typing as we, were, um, as we were going, but just so everybody can have a list of all of them, we will email that to you. Um, let's see, I'm not seeing any more questions, so. Now's your last chance. <laughs> All right. 
Thank you so much, everyone. It was so fabulous arranging Wild with you. Thank you, Linda. You were just tremendous. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Peter, very much for joining us today on, on a Sunday and just giving us your expert horticultural advice. We really appreciate sure, it. Sure, you're welcome. Happy to get everybody planting native plants. Awesome. Well, I hope you all have a wonderful time and you might even consider growing some native plants. As I mentioned, our Grow Native Nursery is open for curbside pickups. You can go to our website, uh, www.calbg.org, C-A-L-B-G.org. And there's a purple button there, I think, that says Buy Plants. And that's going to take you to our online site. Uh, we're open until uh, June 27th. Uh, and so we, we're open for just a few more short weeks here. And we have some of these very plants available. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we will see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.